So what you're looking at here is a laying out skeleton of a mute swan that we got from a rehabilitation center in Florida. And it's a gorgeous specimen and actually what caught our attention were some abnormalities that it has in the hip region. I'm Emily Caggiano and this is another episode of Dissecting with Emily. And so today in this video, we wanted to look at the pathologies we found in this um, skeleton of this mute swan. And so if you come down here and kind of focus, uh, this is the pelvis kind of uh, from the ventral view, so kind of flipped over. Um, this is the right femur and this is the left femur. And obviously, as you can see, one of these things is not like the other. Um, the left femur actually has a pretty bad fracture that occurred and then healed over. Um, in its lifetime of the bird. And if you actually come over here and look at the CT scan data of the bird, you can see that this was actually an oblique overriding fracture. And this means that the bone broke in this oblique kind of angle. And then because of the muscle attachment still on the two pieces of the bone, it actually uh, caused the bone to kind of come in and override each other. Um, and so what ended up happening once this healed over was that the left femur ended up being substantially shorter than the right femur, which we did not see any pathologies on. Okay, I'm going to want you to grab these bones here. I'll set the camera down and run on over. So that disembodied voice is, in fact, me, Larry Whitmer. And so, yeah, we're interested in trying to see if we can figure out um, what this pathology actually meant uh, for, for, for this animal. I'll tell you what, let's stand up um, and show folks what these bones look like. We'll zoom in here a little bit and bear with us as we try to get the focus. It's always a little tricky here. All right, so um, this is the left femur right here. You can actually see um, that oblique fracture that occurred and healed over. And then on the right side is the right femur, which a uh, normal femur, nothing wrong with it. And so if you turn it on, um, kind of on their sides, kind of headlong, you can see the different anatomical aspects. So you have the head of the femur right there on the right femur. And kind of right next to that is the um, trochanter of the femur. And if you look over on the left femur, it still has those features. They're a little bit deformed because of the way that the bone articulated um, with the hip joint, which we'll look at later. And actually, if you look a little bit above those two features, you'll see this extra bone ridge that ended up forming, uh, which we actually wanted to take a closer look at at the pelvis. Yeah, well, let's have a look at that pelvis here. So I'll pull this up uh, right here. And so take the normal side. This is the good side. This is the right side that was actually not affected uh, by, the, by the pathology. I'll try to get the focus right. Is that better? Okay, so um, here is the right femur. Um, and again, it has the, the um, femoral head and the uh, trochanter. And here is the hip side of the hip joint. So the acetabulum or socket. And then this flange right here is called the antitrochanter. And so the femur sits in the joint much like this. So the head is in the acetabulum and the trochanter articulates with the antitrochanter. Anti Basically, the femur just sort of moves up and down like this, and this trochanter, antitrochanter apparatus, in a sense, helps provide a bony stop to prevent the femur from sort of flipping up or hyperabducting like that, which has the benefit is that you don't need these adductor, adductor muscles down here to be as strong to help keep the, 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 uh, the femur from hyperabducting. So this is the normal set. Emily, why don't you show us what's, what's abnormal? So this is the acetabulum of the abnormal side. You can see that it actually has this extra bony ridge that ended up forming. And so if you take that and kind of articulate it back with the femur, you can see that that ridge actually connects with the bony ridge that formed on the femur and kind of forms a false joint. And these actually fit together so tightly that we think it might actually have been a fixed joint and um, not actually allowed free motion of the hip like it should have. Yeah, it's hard to imagine how this thing uh, even really moved. Uh, it may have had some movement, but it may well have been fixed. Okay, well, let's sit down. We'll go back to a wide shot here and see if we can see um, what the other functional consequences of this deformity might be. So uh, the thigh bone connects to the knee bone. So these are, in fact, uh, the knee bones. These are the, uh, the tibiotarsis and the fibula. This is on the unaffected right side. This is on the affected left side. And one of the things you can see is that these are the same. These are basically symmetrical or mirror images. In fact, that extends all the way down to the feet, too. So although the, the femora are messed up, at least on the left side, there was no real manifestation of that distal to the knee joint. 
Let's see if we can kind of try to make this thing work. So we'll, we'll put this thing in here, and we can sort of see here on the, on the unaffected right side that the knee swings forward and back, forward and aft, like a proper knee should. If we come over and look at this um, messed up side on the left side, we see that the whole limb is going to be swinging out to the side. So on the right side, normal, fore aft, but on the left side, because of the wonky hip joint, the limb is already flipping out to the side. And so, very different sorts of gates. This animal would have walked very funny, but the limb bones seem kind of normal. And this kind of shows the physiological um, adaptation ability that the uh, bodies of animals have, and so it's able to take some kind of abnormality that occurs in the body, and because of the plasticity that these animals have, they're able to compensate for that abnormality um, and keep the other structures normal so that the animal is still able to survive and thrive. Yeah, so hopefully you've learned from our poor swan here how animals can, in a sense, cope and compensate for the disabilities that these animals uh, must have had. We don't really know how this animal moved, but we can get a sense of it by looking at the skeleton. So, I'm Larry Whitmer. And I'm Emily Caggiano, and that's all for today. Thanks.